We're actually going to be deriving Snell's law. My favorite mathematical theorem is actually let's solve a beautiful physics problem which is only half a mark from the International Physics Olympiad in India. Imagine that I have a couple of substances with different refractive indices. So let's say that we have y against x and this here I'm going to call this y1 and that's going to be the boundary between those two substances. This one here will have a refractive index of n1 and this one here will have a refractive index of n2. A light ray is going to go from the origin and then it's going to strike the boundary at a point. Let's call this point simply, well, alpha. And then let's say that the light ray goes here to a point, let's call that P, let's give it some coordinates, X naught, Y naught. And the angle of refraction is going to be given by I2. The question is, what actually determines those angles? Can we derive a relationship between the angles I1 and I2? Hint, we're actually going to be deriving Snell's law from Fermat's principle of least time. This is so exciting. It's really useful to start physics Olympiad problems simply by writing some fundamentals. So we know that the refractive index is defined as the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in that particular substance. So for n1 I'm going to say that the light ray has a speed v1 going through here. I'm also just going to call this distance d1, I'm going to also going to call this distance d2. The same is going to be true for the second substance which is going to be c divided by v2. What about the total time that the light ray is going to spend in there? Well let's call this T. Well that's just going to be equal to T1, the time that it spends in medium 1, plus T2, which is going to be the time that it spends in medium 2. Now as we remember from school physics, time is distance over speed. Wait, it's distance over speed, isn't it? Yeah. So we can actually write this as D1 divided by V1 plus D2 divide that by V2. Okay, now we can actually plug in an expression for V1 in terms of the refractive index and what we're going to get is D1 divided by V1 rearranged is just going to be equal to C over N1 and V2 rearranged is just going to be C over N2. Okay, those can go in here, C and then a factor of N1 plus D2, then divide that by C and then multiply by N2. And now we can use one of my favorite mathematical theorems, the Pythagoras theorem. Side note, but do you have a favorite mathematical theorem? I'm very curious, do let me know in the comments below. Even more of a side note, but my favorite mathematical theorem is actually Gauss's divergence theorem. Let me know if you'd like me to make a video about this at some point. Back to this. So the distance d1, we can actually find that using Pythagoras because this angle here is going to be 90 because that's this here is just the normal. So we can say that d1 is actually just going to be given by the square root of alpha squared plus y1 squared, which is just this distance over here. Okay, let's bring the factor of n1 over c here, and then plus n2 over c, d2. Let's be a bit careful with the coordinates. We're going to need this distance squared, which is going to be, well, by Pythagoras, the square root of x0 minus alpha squared plus y naught take away y1 squared. And this here is the time. Now according to this very deep principle, the light will take a path such as to minimize the time taken between two points. So out of all the different paths that the light could possibly take, which are going to correspond to a different intersection coordinate, alpha, the light is going to pick the one which minimizes the time. So if you think about it, this total time here is actually a function of alpha. Now as I was speaking, I noticed a small error. Let's fix that. It chooses the path that minimizes time. We need to differentiate. So the t alpha divided 
by d alpha is going to be equal to now n1c that will be the derivative of the square root which is going to be 1 over 2 the square root of alpha squared plus y1 squared however that's just the outside function the inside function is alpha squared plus uh, y1 squared so we need to differentiate that with respect to alpha which is just 2 alpha by the, by the chain rule, these are going to cancel out nicely, plus n2c, and then once again the derivative of a square root is 1 over 2, then we have the square root of x0 minus alpha squared plus y0 minus y1 squared. Okay, the derivative of the inside function, this here has no factors of alpha, so we can ignore that, but this one here does. So just to make our life a little bit easier, I'm going to expand it out, so it's going to be x0 squared minus 2x0 alpha plus alpha squared. I think that's right. So the derivative of this function with respect to alpha is just going to give me minus 2x0, that's the derivative of this, plus the derivative of that which is 2 alpha. Notice those 2's cancelling out. Perfect. So this here is just going to give me n1c1 alpha over the square root of alpha squared plus y1 squared plus n2c and then we're going to get let's let's take a factor of minus here and inside here we're going to get x naught minus alpha divided by the square root of x naught minus alpha squared plus y naught minus y1 squared. And let's set this derivative to be equal to zero because now we can do some more cancelling out. Oh, this one shouldn't be here because we can cancel out the speed of light from both sides. And notice something remarkable. Alpha over this distance is actually alpha over that which is just opposite over the hypotenuse. So this is really exciting. So I'm going to write this all the way up here. n1 multiplied by opposite of a hypotenuse, well that's just the sine of i1 plus, wait, minus n2 and then this x0 minus alpha, well that's just this distance which is essentially that divided by the square root of that over that, well that's just the this hypotenuse d2. So once again this here is actually just the sine of i2 and we can just rearrange this and say that n1 sine of i1 has to be equal to n2 sine of i2 and now you know where Snell's law actually comes from. This is such a fun derivation but this is not the complete problem. I have actually filmed the previous part which will really help you understand potential potential enforces and applying these rules for points and this is precisely why you should have a look at this video right over here.